So we're here in the WIT studio with Oscar Ramos, Managing Director of Orbit Startups. Um, Oscar, so I want to bring up a quote that you requoted in an interview, right? You said, you cannot walk in your customer's shoes if you do not remove yours. So can you explain that? Like, what does that mean? Well, I think that um, something that is very important when you think about uh, about innovation is uh, is that that innovation needs to be very customer centric, mm-hmm. very user centric. And uh, when we talk about B two B or B two C, it doesn't matter. No, like you really want to understand the challenge of a family traveling. I mean, if you are a single person, first you need to understand. Okay, as a single person, you have flexibility that a family might not have. Right. But if you think about uh, about any service that uh, that will impact any of the of the workers in um, in any of the companies involved in the travel industry, you also need to think about uh, about their reality and about about their limitations. So that capacity to to forget about our assumptions or or preconceptions is critical for like successful innovation. Right. And that has a lot to do with customer behavior and just looking at things from a customer point of view. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, correct. It's it's a customer and user no? because uh, customer there's user. also many situations where um, maybe a hotel manager makes a decision because he or she said thinks that this is the best solution. Mm-hmm. But then the workers that will need to actually use the solution will have a different point of view. No? This is like similar. I always use the example of, uh, of parents buying educational toys for children that right. are so boring that kids don't want to play with, uh, with, with them. So here's the same. No? It needs to be something that achieves the goals of the of the manager, that in that case might be the, the customer, and the goals of the of the user. So they actually embrace the solution and, and take it. No? The goals of the user as well. Um, so just zooming in on travel, I guess that works for travel too, right? Or travel especially. Um, is it a mindset that you look for in the travel startups that you engage with, that you work with? Yes, it's actually very important, no? and, uh, and maybe I can I can quote an example of uh, of one of our companies. Yes. So, uh, particularly when we saw uh, travel uh, coming back to to after after COVID, uh, many many hotels, airlines, service industries in general, they had a need to bring in talent back, mm-hmm. and and that talent need to be trained. And particularly, a certain type of uh, of frontline workers that that, that were remotely, um, they need a lot of support in this type of training. But this training is is, is costly, and and sometimes it's not the most entertaining one. But it is important. Takes so a long time. Takes a long time. Mm-hmm. So one of our portfolio companies, what they they do is like well, they realize that people love love games. Particularly, uh, mobile games are something that create a lot of engagement. Right. So what this company did is that they use uh, a lot of the learnings from uh, from all of these games that they used to create um, more engagement, more fun, and they use all of those techniques to uh, develop a solution and, and roll out a solution that was supporting learning, development, and and in general, um, in general behavioral behavioral change. Mm-hmm. What was impressive is that the engagement that this company had was on par with any game. 70% of the users were using the app every day, even during their holiday, even during their weekends, because they, right. the dynamics of learning make the whole experience uh, fun and, and, and rewarding. So gamification, they just gamify the entire process. Yeah, you could you could say that is is right. is gamification. It's like using game dynamics inside all the the learning and development process. Right, right. So uh, shifting to China, China is obviously a big base for you. Uh, what are some unique things that the China startup ecosystem has that no one else in the world has? What is unique to them? Well, it's actually very um, very very interesting. I think China as a market. Um, is a is a is a high growth market. Mm. It's a market where you still have many. There's a lot of uh, activity happening. There's a lot of uh, uh, change, and there's many situations where where consumers will be experiencing something for the first time. Right. Still, a lot of a huge user base, uh, customer base, uh, tourist base that will be travel in, traveling internationally for the first time, um, and and that creates obviously a very unique uh, situation mm-hmm. that um, that creates an opportunity for for very specific type of products or, or services that can cater to, to that experience, no? to make sure that the, the travel experience needs to be enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Is it more high growth now or was it always like this even before the pandemic? Or has the pandemic sort of supercharged that high growth? Well, I think that like pre-pandemic, the numbers were already like really, really 
high, you know, and right. depending especially on what areas you, you travel and what times you travel. If you travel during the during the main uh, Chinese vacation, you'll see that that presence of Chinese tourists. COVID slowed down everything, and, uh, and particularly in China, was was obviously like very very slow. Heavily and now impacted. That, yeah, now that everything is is uh, is back to regular activity, you see uh, again a rebound of international travel with a lot of curiosity and willingness to to learn and experience. Um, international uh, uh, destinations. Right, right. So just sticking with the high growth for a bit, right, you work with a lot of startups at Orbit. Um, what is the biggest thing that a startup gets wrong during the rapid expansion or rapid growth phase? I think that um, it's actually uh, something that, that today is going through a very important correction mm -hmm. in the venture capital, which is growth at any cost. Um, you need to grow, but you need to grow in a sustainable manner. Right. Uh, the economic sustainability of growth is very important. Uh, when venture capital was easily accessible, there were many companies that in their pursuit of capturing, capturing market share, they were growing a business. And as they were growing, the more they sold, the more they serve customers, the more money they lose. They right. didn't actually work on optimizing the unit economics. That is quite critical. So I think this is very, very important. And particularly, there's one element of this unit economics which is critical. Because at the end of the day, the cost of service is, is, is the cost of service. Obviously, you're not going to, I mean, you should not serve something that you are not able to, to have a profit um, ever. There's sometimes yeah. economies of scale where you need to reach a minimum amount of, uh, of transactions to make the service valuable. But there's one variable in that cost, which is the customer acquisition cost, that is super critical, where there's a big opportunity for optimization. And this is one of the key areas that we work with our companies. First, we work with them on, on nailing that, that unit economics on the cost of service, the cost of, uh, of the product. And second, working on the distribution. Because hmm. uh, like for consumer startups, 40 to 50% of venture capital that is raised goes directly to customer acquisition. And, uh, and that's an area where I think many it's a big startups... number. It's a really big number. Yeah, We're yeah, talking yeah. about a huge amount that, that doesn't go to create better products for customers, doesn't go to create better infrastructure, doesn't go to solve some of the key challenges that, that, that humanity is facing. No? Like sustainability is not just about economic sustainability right. uh, from the from the seller point of view. It's also about social sustainability. It's also about, about environmental sustainability, which right. is very important. And, and all the ESGs. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um, we're talking about AI. We hear the human revolution with Singapore 2023, right? What kind of adoption are you looking for before engaging with a company? Like, is AI a big criteria for you? Well, I think that, uh, that today AI is like email was maybe... 25 years ago. <laughs> Every organization needs to use uh, AI at the core of their um, of their uh, or of their operation. So internally, operationally, they need to be using AI. The way they also engage with their customers, the different stakeholders need to leverage AI for a better experience, for a better service, for simply more more efficiency. Right. But there's also an opportunity to consider for many organizations a change in their business model mm -hmm. and and how they actually create that value, how they, they uh, monetize and, and, and create value for themselves. And that's, I think, the, the most interesting aspect. You know? There's companies that are enabled with AI. Mm -hmm. They are simply offering a very traditional service. And that's a very, that itself creates value. But where I think we're going to see the most interesting uh, opportunity is the companies that are going to be able to have a fundamental change, not only on themselves, but in the whole industry, thanks to thanks to AI, you know? and, and we can see that everywhere. Now, we're already seeing. Like I'm lucky to to have been part of this change in that revolution already for for many years. That's something that, like, our society is is realizing today. It is here, but we've seen it. Yeah. And and the interesting aspect is that I don't think it's a technology bottleneck. The real bottleneck has always been the the social adoption. Um, the concerns and fears that organizations will have at, at different levels. So the human in the whole equation yeah. is the bottleneck. Yeah, well, in, in general, I mean, we are what the, the ones that can create the magic. Right. We're also the ones that can stop it from happening. Right, right. That's awesome. Um, how is Orbit itself working with AI? Anything in the pipeline? Anything that you are you know, experimenting with? Well, we, we, we like to eat our own dog food. So we're constantly... <laughs> Uh, testing and experimenting yeah. first our own portfolio companies. So mm -hmm. we we we've invested in like 
more than 100 companies that, that have AI at the core of, uh, of their operations. And, and right. we do use these companies first as a way to, to evaluate and pre-evaluate the, the product, but also some of them, they, they help us uh, mm -hmm. work. So we, we use AI uh, in, in, let's say, the, the whole spectrum of, of, of what we do. And, uh, and we also um, use, uh, like, help our own portfolio companies improve the, their own operations by by sharing a lot of the best practices. No? I think right now what we are seeing is that thanks to the to the awareness that has been created about the potential of generative AI to to improve some um, some specific industries, there's more niche applications that can be very, very valuable. Right. Right. Like they say if you own a restaurant, you have to know how to cook. Right? You can't just depend completely on the chef. Yeah, well, I mean, but there's many in a restaurant, for example. There's many areas where where AI can potentially help um, simply on planning on on your on your procurement, so right. you can optimize. And one of the problems of restaurants is making sure that they don't over purchase or mm -hmm. they purchase in the right way. Um, they can also have um, have uh, some advice in terms of like not just the perception that the owners have of what people like, mm -hmm. uh, but but what is actually people people liking. There's some some trends that they can they can leverage from the market. If they know that certain products in the market are more expensive, some others are in, in high supply, they could potentially adapt their menu. There's many, many opportunities. The the training of, of the of the employees um, right. so they can have a better service they can reduce waste no? like like waste mm -hmm. generation is a, is a big challenge and particularly in the in the F&B industry is a big problem. So how can you reduce this? Basically, like there's no limit on how much we can uh, we can do and and surprisingly many of these opportunities they don't actually need like very advanced AI. Like mm -hmm. very simple machine learning and automation can be used to already generate very um very valuable uh, short-term return. Right, 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 right. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges faced by the travel startup ecosystem today? I think that um, that well, uh, we're going through uh, a, a still a change. Uh, I think that uh, that like the change that that COVID created uh, globally uh, is still something that we're that we're learning, and, and the whole world still adapting to different ways of uh, of doing things. And obviously, travel was one of the areas that was more uh, that was more um, more impacted. Right. But I do think that uh, that always every challenge. Um, can become an opportunity. You know? I mean, Chinese, when we talk about, about crises, the, 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 the mm -hmm. whole combination of the word talks about the risk and, and the opportunity. So right. that's the way we look at it. You know? Like all of these challenges are, are opportunities. I think that the redefinition of, uh, of corporate travel is something that, uh, that has been um, discussed widely in, a, in this conference. We just started a conference, but that's already right. a topic that has been discussed where, where many organizations are, are talking about, uh, about the fact that they should reduce that, uh, this limited budget value and at the same time there's this huge cost for the environment and I think that's another one of the key topics that um, that needs to be addressed no? the, the, this, the environmental impact and, and the social impact that uh, that travel creates with uh, with over tourism in some uh, in some areas with um, with like the reduction of uh, or, or the the prices increases increase in, in certain parts of the of the world that makes mm -hmm. Life of regular citizens in that in that area complicated, and of course, like the carbon footprint yeah. that the industry have. I think those are those are challenges, but I do believe there are also great opportunities. No, like at least from our side, that's the way we look at, at startups. No, and, and how we we look at companies that are helping hotels and and, and other players in the space mm -hmm. source locally, so they can they can support the local communities, they can reduce the the um, the carbon footprint or the other procurement, and at the same time, they can create a better, more unique experience for for right. the travelers. No, you don't need to have the same experience if you go to like America or or uh, or Asia or Africa or Europe. You you might actually like to enjoy. A bit of the local local flavor, and mm -hmm. that's that's part of the value that you can bring. Right, right. So, last question for you, Oscar. Uh, what are some exciting startup trends that you are looking forward to in twenty twenty four? Well, for me, um, I'm not sure I will call it exciting, no, because one of the key areas that I'm more more interested in is uh, what I describe as boring industries right. that are very inefficient mm -hmm. that can get a lot of value with um with digitization but mm -hmm. for me it's actually very exciting I, I see i'm very excited about about making something more 
more productive, more efficient. That means that we can achieve more with less. That means that we can we can make it more accessible, so more people can uh, can enjoy that. And for me, that's that's very that's th those types of industries are very 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 exciting. I think that uh, that um, particularly right now. Uh, all the embedded finance uh, and embedded insurance mm -hmm. space is something that uh, that is going to create a lot of opportunities to to support more innovation uh, itself. Because um, for a long time, many many startups they were they were supported with advertisement, but the changes in the in the online advertisement industry have evolved in a way that makes it makes them a bit unsustainable for many of these players with uh, more and more concentration right. in a limited number of uh, of advertisers. So this trend of embedded finance, embedded insurance is creating more options for, for innovators to bring products to market and, and monetize them. So those are areas that I'm very, very excited about. Right, right. Oscar, thank you so much for your time. A pleasure to be here today. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>